Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We turn now in our study of Poetics Unit 4 to page 638, 639 and following. In our notice, just like our freshman anthology, we have poetry collections. We have a number of poems that are put together. Uh, right away, we want to start though, we're, we're going to be working with the Pushkin text, the Bridegroom. But before we get there, we want to make sure that we have this information on 639 written in 2B. The speaker in poetry. The speaker is the voice that says the words of a poem. The speaker may be a character that the poet invents. The speaker may also bear a close resemblance to the poet. And of course, sometimes in poetry, it can actually be the, the poet itself. However, it's wrong to assume, as we've already said, that the poet and the speaker are identical. Speaker is a persona, an assumed imagined voice. In narrative poetry, the speaker tells a story from a particular point of view. Make sure you've got that term, narrative poetry. Uh, uh, any poem that tells a story, that's narrative poetry. In lyric poetry, the speaker shares thoughts, feelings, and insights to create a single unified impression. Most poems employ imagery, which is language that appeals to the senses. Likewise, many poems use figurative language, words and phrases that create unexpected comparisons or play with meanings. While we're reading now aloud, we want to appreciate fluent reading, okay? We want to share the musical qualities of poetry. As you read aloud, read fluently with expression and understanding to achieve reading fluency. Adjust your reading rate. Write that down. First, read the poem slowly, carefully. Make sure you understand it, that you can pronounce all the words. Pay attention to punctuation and group words for meaning. Do not pause at line ends unless punctuation indicates you should. Slow down to emphasize an idea or the sound of words. Reread the poem and listen for the tone or emotional attitude the words create. You're going to have a reading chart at the bottom of page 639, which can help you. We do have some vocabulary in 640 that will end up on the assessment, so make sure you study that. We're going to turn to our first of four writers, Alexander Pushkin, and we have a little bit of biography on him on page 641. Note your dates, 1799 to 1837. The title of the poem we're going to be working with is The Bridegroom. Alexander Pushkin is considered the father of modern Russian literature. Though a nobleman, he had great sympathy for poor Russian peasants, very much like Tolstoy. In literature, too, he was a rebel, drawing on folklore to express his democratic ideas. Now, this poem is an interesting poem. It's a variation, write this down at level one. It's a variation of the folk motif of a worthy young person declaring independence. Read with me on page 642. An illusion, you want this at 2B. An allusion is a reference to a person, event, place, or artistic work, often to one that is well known. Push, uh, Pushkin's poem is an extended allusion to a folk tale, the robber bridegroom. We want to write that down, the robber bridegroom. From the opening lines, Pushkin's Russian readers would have recognized the story in which a woman witnesses a horrible crime and nearly marries the man who committed it. There will be three movements in this poem. Write this down at level one. There will be three movements in this narrative poem. It's just simply going to tell a story. You could easily turn this poem into a short story, and it would work rather well. I think poetically, though, it works far better. Now, let's just read along. We'll read. We'll pause at moments in level one, because this is a longer poem, to make sure we know exactly what it is that's going on. Are you ready? The Bridegroom. I'm with you on 643. Again, the challenge is conquer monkey mind. Follow with me, especially those of you who say, I struggle to read poetry and enjoy it. Read along with me and let me help you learn how to read poetry again, okay? The Bridegroom. For three days, Natasha, the merchant's daughter, was missing. The third night, she ran in distraught. Her father and mother plied her with questions. She didn't hear them. She could hardly breathe. Stricken with foreboding, they pleaded, got angry, but still she was silent. And at last, they gave up. Natasha's cheeks regained their rosy color and cheerfully again she sat with her sisters. Once, at the shingle gate, she sat with her friends and a swift troika flashed by before them, a, a, a carriage, right? a, a, a sleigh. Flashed by before them, a handsome, Young man stood driving the horses. Snow and mud went flying, splashing the girls. He gazed as he flew past, and Natasha gazed. He flew on. Natasha froze. Headlong, she ran home. It was he. It was he, she cried. I know it. I recognized him. Papa, Mama, save me from him. Full of grief and fear, they shake their heads. By the way, notice the shift. 
from past to present tense. Full of grief and fear, they shake their heads, sighing. Her father says, my child, tell me everything. If someone has harmed you, tell us even a hint. She weeps again, and her lips remain sealed. Okay, let's pause for a second. Write it down at level one. What do we know so far? Three things. One, the girl in our story is named Natasha, a young girl. She comes in. She's clearly really upset. But she won't tell her mom and dad why. Two, she finally comes back to her normal self. She's sitting outside next to the road. She's sitting with her sisters. This drop-dead gorgeous guy comes driving by in a sled. He looks directly at her. And she immediately, number three, freaks out. She runs inside. She says, it was him, it was him, to her dad. Protect me, protect me. And the dad says, honey, whatever you need. But she doesn't explain to him what's going on. Part two of the poem, 644. The next morning, are you reading with me? The next morning, the old matchmaking woman unexpectedly calls and sings the girl's praises, says to the father, you have the goods and I a buyer for them, a handsome young man. He bows low to no one. He lives like a lord with no debts nor worries. He's rich and he's generous, says he will give his bride on their wedding day a fox fur coat, a pearl, gold rings, brocaded dresses. Yesterday, out driving, he saw your Natasha. Shall we shake hands and get her to church? The woman starts to eat a pie and talks in riddles while the poor girl does not know where to look. Agreed, says her father. Go in happiness to the altar, Natasha. It's dull for you here. A swallow should not spend all its time singing. It's time for you to build a nest for your children. Natasha, notice now the shift back to past tense. Natasha leaned against the wall and tried to speak, but found herself sobbing. She was shuddering and laughing. The matchmaker poured out a cup of water, gave her some to drink, Splash some in her face. Her parents are distressed. Notice we're back to present tense again. Then Natasha recovered. Notice past tense. Notice how Pushkin's playing this game. And calmly she said, Your will be done. Call my bridegroom to the feast. Bake loaves for the whole world. Brew sweet meat. And call the law to the feast. Of course, Natasha, angel, you know we give our lives to make you happy. They bake and they brew. The worthy guests come. The bride is led to the feast. Her maids sing and weep. Then horses and a sleigh with a groom. And all sit. The glasses ring and clatter. The toasting cup is passed from hand to hand in tumult. The guests are drunk. Okay, let's put it at level one. Next movement in our poem. The next day after this bizarre event with seeing the handsome boy and the sleigh and all that, the next day the matchmaker comes. In Russian society, two things. This is what we call arranged marriages. In Russian society, you have usually an old woman whose job it is to kind of play the middle go-between person. So the old woman shows up and says, I've got a fine husband for your daughter. Daddy says, to his daughter, I think it's time you get married. This is probably a good match. Daughter freaking out and yet decides, fine, let's do it. But notice she makes a request or two. Let's make sure we've got a little bit of wine, me, and let's make sure we got law enforcement here. Okay? Now, as we said in our studies earlier, great writers make readers ask the simple question of why. Like, what is going on here? Go ahead and try and make a prediction really quickly of what you think is going on. What do you think is about to happen in this poem? We now come to the third and the last part of the poem. Notice that we're going to have speakers who will speak by the headings. Do you see it? So as I read, I will say who it is that's speaking. And of course, I will adjust my voice to try to at least help us to know who it is that's speaking. I'm on page 645. Let's go to work. The bridegroom speaks first. I'm at line 103. Friends, why is my fair bride sad? Why is she not feasting and serving? 
bride answers the groom. I will tell you why as best I can. My soul knows no rest. Day and night I weep. An evil dream oppresses me. Her father says, My dear child, tell us what your dream is. I dreamed, she says, that I went into a forest. It was late and dark. The moon was faintly shining behind a cloud. I'm on 646. The moon was faintly shining behind a cloud. I strayed from the path. Nothing stirred except the, stop, the tops of the pine trees. And suddenly, as if I was awake, I saw a hut. I approached the hut and knocked at the door. Silence, a prayer on my lips. I open the door and enter. A candle burns. All is silver and gold. The bridegroom, what is bad about that? It promises wealth. The bride continues, wait, sir, I've not finished. Silently, I gazed on the silver and gold, the cloths, the rugs, the silks from Novgorod, and I was lost in wonder. Then I heard a shout and a clatter of hooves. Someone has driven by to the porch. Quickly, I slammed the door and hid behind the stove. Now I hear many voices, 12 Young men come in, and with them is a girl, pure and beautiful. They've taken no notice of the icons. They sit to the table without praying or taking off their hats. At the head, I'm on page 647, at the head, the eldest brother at his right, the youngest at his left, the girl shouts, laughs, drunken clamor. The bridegroom says, that betokens merriment. Everybody's happy. In other words, your dream isn't a bad dream at all. The bride, wait, sir, I'm not finished. The drunken din goes on and grows louder still. Only the girl is sad. She sits silent, neither eating nor drinking, but sheds tears in plenty. The eldest brother takes his knife and whistling sharpens it. Seizing her by the hair, he kills her and cuts off her right hand. Why? says the groom, this is nonsense. Believe me, my love, your dream is not evil. She looks him in the eyes. And from whose hand does that rain come? The bride said. The whole throng rose in the silence. With a clatter, the rain falls and rolls along the floor. The groom blanches, goes pale trembles, confusion. Seize him, the law commands. He's bound, judged, put to death. Natasha is famous, our song at an end. All right, jot down what happens in the third part. Well, who is this guy that she's been asked to marry? Of course, she knows this is the guy that she saw while she was wandering in the woods. She saw a girl killed and, of course, came back at the beginning of our poem to be very, very distraught. When she sees him riding in the sled, she knows exactly who he is, which is why she goes in to tell her father and ironically ends up the next day, with the matchmaker's help then, being proposed to this guy to be married. Notice her two requests. Let's make sure we got some drinking going on and let's make sure we got law enforcement there. Notice instead of accusing him directly, she tells of a strange dream, which was actually, of course, what? Her wandering through the woods and coming unexpectedly into this hut, into this house, this little hut in the woods, and then witnessing something horrific. By the way, this is again an allusion to an old motif in Russian literature. That is to say, she saw something and then she has to kind of like tell about it or whatever. At the very end, of course, she is able through this dream sequence to make sure that she catches him because when she asks him, where did you get that ring? He, he drops to the floor and clearly he's guilty. Okay, that's level one. Jot down at level 2A, what do you think the major message of a poem like this is? Some have argued that this is a poem that suggests you have to be careful about the people who you associate with who are strangers. Sometimes we don't know everything. And because we don't know everything, sometimes we have to live in a world where we have to be a little bit cautious around people. Another major message here, though, is the strength of the young girl. Notice, she stands up for herself, but she uses intelligence to get through the terrible experience. At 2B, 
of course, here, our focus is narrative poetry. This is a poem that just simply tells a story. As we said, this poem could easily, we've done this before in sophomore English, where we took this poem and turned it into a story, and we wrote it with dialogue and the like. Some students, however, once they've done that activity, have to admit, this is cooler, works better as a poem, because it kind of catches you unawares. You're like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? You think maybe there's something wrong with Natasha, and then you find out at the end that really this is a poem about a hero, a heroine, a young girl who figures out a way to make sure that justice is served. At 3A, what is the text for you that comes closest to a story like this? Do you have a text where somebody in the end gets what they deserved, right? That is to say, they kind of thought they would get away with something, but at the very end, they somehow get jacked. And it may have something to do with a smart young girl. Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice comes to mind. You can write that one down, a play that you will love to study later in your high school career, playing the exact same kind of game. Finally, at 3B, what was a time in your life when you helped some unjust act be served justice? What was a time in your life when you assumed something about someone only to discover later that he or she was not what he or she appeared to be? I hope that your study of Pushkin will lead you to read more poems by this amazing poet. Thank you.